When we read passages of scripture, we just read them quickly, we read through them, and we don't take on the real impact. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read scripture, I like to read it slowly, and I like to read passages over several times. And that's not because I'm thick, and I need to read them several times, although you can have your own opinion on that. Um, It's because I like to really try and get into what's going on. And in this passage, when we watch it, we're left with that impression of like, wow, you know, some of us have probably grown up since we were little, knowing that, oh yeah, Jesus fed the 5,000 people, but not really thought about what's involved with that. And this morning we're going to explore that a little bit. Now, you'll probably have noticed that the passage that we uh, were read uh, was from the book of Matthew, and the clip we've just seen was from the Gospel of John. Um, and if any of you are interested, you can actually watch it. It's on YouTube. The whole of the Gospel of John acted out like that. It's done to the Good News Bible. Um, it's about three hours long, so it's the kind of thing you watch in installments, um, or you just sit down like you would with Netflix in the afternoon or something and just watch it. But it is actually worth watching because it is really, really good. It goes through the whole of the life of Jesus and his miracle. It's really good. Now, the passage starts off with the phrase, as soon as Jesus heard the news. So we have to kind of go back a little bit. Well, what news did, did Jesus hear? Because they didn't have the BBC and they didn't have social media and they didn't have all the kind of things that we get our news from. So somebody had come to Jesus and told him some news. And the news he'd been given was actually really bad news. He'd just been told that his cousin, John the Baptist, was dead. Now, when we get news that somebody has died, it, it's heartbreaking. It's, it, can re- it really affects us, particularly if it's somebody close to us. But John the Baptist hadn't just died of old age. He hadn't died of uh, a terrible illness. He hadn't been in a, a terrible accident. He'd actually been beheaded. Now, we're not going to go into the story of John the Baptist this morning, but I'd really encourage you to read back, uh, particularly in the Gospel of John, and read what happened to John the Baptist, because he died under ridiculously tragic circumstances. He should not have had happen to him what did happen. So Jesus wouldn't just have been a little bit upset. Jesus would have been grieving. This was his cousin. They were born at a very, very similar time. Their mothers were very close. If you read the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, there's the bit where uh, uh, Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. And when the two mothers come together, she says that her baby literally leapt in the womb. And that baby was John the Baptist. So Jesus heard this news. And so often when we hear bad news, what what do we want to do? When you have really, really bad news, I don't know about you, but sometimes you just want to be on your own. You think, oh, you know what, I I just need to go and get away. I just need some time out. I just need some peace and quiet. I need to be away from everyone. So he went with his disciples, and he went away. In fact, he went away um, by boat. And Josh has got a slide up here, which will give you uh, an idea of how far... No, not that one. That's just humorous. Okay. Now, you can see, if you look at... Um, the, 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 I can't point because I haven't got a pointer. The dot sort of towards the top, Jesus went, that's it, thanks, Josh. And then sort of in a straight line, all the way. You can see all those, those little boats flowing. Now you've gone away, away Josh. Wrong way. Oh, your battery's gone. Okay, he, went, he, went, he went quite a long way to get away from the crowds. But people knew so much about Jesus, they weren't going to be deterred by the fact that this man, and they, they wouldn't have known necessarily why he'd gone off to be on his own. So they, they followed him. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if I'm honest, if, if I'm going through something like that, I do just, I'd want to be on my own. I really would. But have you ever been in a situation, maybe not when you're grieving, maybe just an everyday, normal situation, uh, you've invited some people over for a meal, or you've gone somewhere for a meal, and you just don't want to be there, or you really wish they'd go, or you think you've invited them for lunch, and at six o'clock in the afternoon, they're still there. Come on, hands up. If If that's ever happened to you, there's some fibbers in church this morning. We've all been there. Okay, and I'm looking at the people who put their hands up thinking, oh, I've been to their house. I wonder if that (laughs) that was me. But we've all done it. We've all been somewhere and sort of looked, oh, crumbs, how long do we have to stay before it would be rude to make our excuses? Okay, but Jesus wasn't like that. Jesus didn't look at all these people coming and think, oh, for Pete's sake, I've come around to get a bit of peace and quiet. And look, they've gone and followed me here. I just want to be alone. 
It says something that Jesus says in that passage. I love the little bit where it says, Jesus had compassion on them. And Josh, if you can put the slide up. Um, I actually went to the dictionary. I know what compassion is. Um, some people say occasionally it would feel it. Um, a feeling of deep sympathy and sorrow for another who was stricken by misfortune, accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate the suffering. Now, it's very easy to have compassion. Yeah? I can look out here this morning and think, oh, dear me, I do feel so poor Andrew. He works with, oh, no, he works at college with Barnfield students. That's, that's tough. You know, I can, I can look at Nigel and think, oh, Nigel, he, he's got a lot going on. He went on a really long walk yesterday, and it was a tough walk for Nigel. If you want to know more about that, ask Nigel later. Okay? It's easy to have compassion, but to move from just saying you have it to move on to the stage where you want to do something about somebody's suffering, where you want to alleviate, which means you want to get involved with it. You want to take it away. You want to try and make it easier for that person. And that is a completely different thing. That is far different. But Jesus looked at them and he wanted to alleviate their suffering. He saw these people and his heart just went out for them. He said, I want to, I want to do something for these people. They're like sheep without a shepherd. They just, they need to know, he knew they needed to know God. That's what they ultimately needed to know. Now Jesus had obviously spent some time with them. They'd have been there for, um, for, for, for quite a long length of time because it said later that evening. Now Jesus' disciples um, they kind of sort of were getting to the idea, they were thinking, well, you know, probably need to send the people home now, Jesus, because, you know, it's getting a bit late, and uh, they, they, they're probably getting a bit hungry. Um, truth be told, the disciples may have just been getting a little bit fed up. You know, the people had been there all day, they knew Jesus had come away for some peace and quiet, they probably wanted some peace and quiet, and uh, he said, they need to go in and um, get, they need to go and get some food, they said to Jesus, because they'll be hungry, you know, we don't want them sort of fainting on the way home. And what does Jesus turn around and say? He does that simple little line where he says, you give them something to eat. Now, I don't know about you, but so often in, in the Christian life, if you really, really follow Jesus, you might look at a situation that's quite tragic, that's quite dire, that's quite unacceptable, and you might think, you know what, somebody really needs to do something about that. That, that situation's just not right. Somebody should do something about it. But if you're a person of faith and you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to be very, very cautious because very often what Jesus says is, you give them something to eat. You alleviate that suffering. You go and do something about it. And sometimes we kind of shut that noise out. One of my favorite films from years ago is um, Beverly Hills Cop. Um, how many of you remember Beverly Hills Cop with Eddie Murphy? It's a, it's a classic comedy. And there's one bit where the captain... Um, Eddie Murphy plays a police it's hard to imagine Eddie Murphy being a, a policeman isn't it but he is in this, in this film and his captain is trying to tell him something and he literally puts his fingers in he goes la 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 Axel is not listening to the captain la 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 and he blots out everything the captain is saying to him so often we do that with Jesus we see something Jesus lays it on our heart to do something about it. And what we do, we try and surround ourselves with noise and surround ourselves with other things so that we don't actually want to do something about it. But not Jesus. After spending the day with them, he says to his disciples, you go and feed them. Now, one of the disciples, uh, one of the, I'd say probably one of the more kind of forward-thinking disciples, he's probably already had a thought, well, there's a lot of people here and, yeah, they're going to be hungry. It says that there were 5,000 um, men there. And 5,000 is a lot. Um, it's an awful lot, but that wasn't including the, the women and the children. And, uh, and Jesus has said, feed them. So one of the disciples, he's kind of probably planned ahead and thought, you know what? I've got this. I'm going to go and have a look, see what we've got. And he's gone off. Um, doesn't say this in the Bible. This is, this is kind of what I'm, in, I'm interpreting perhaps could have happened. Um, he goes off and he finds a little boy that's got five loaves of bread and, and two fish. Now, five loaves of bread and two fish. Lizzie, you're going to come and help me this morning, okay? Okay, so can you come up here and, and help me? Because you remember last time we had that big bucket of water and I got Steve to very, very poorly walk on it? Well, I, I've got... Now, this is the kind of basket they would have used in Bible times because they didn't have plastic and glass and all those kind of things. They, they had the, those ones, right? And in here... 
I have freshly baked this morning, and that is the honest truth. I baked them this morning. Fantastic. They're called part bake. You buy them and then you stick them in the oven. <laughs> okay, so we're going to count. Ready? One. One. Two. Three. Okay, they didn't have foil in Bible times either. Um, now in here, I've wrapped them because they can smell, can't they? Um, okay, can you just tell everybody, could you tell everybody what's in there, please? See, this fish. Plastic fish. Yeah, okay. If I brought real fish into the church, there'd be smell here all, all week. So, okay, so what I want you to do, okay, I, I'm estimating there's probably about 60 people here this morning. I'm not very good with numbers. I want everybody here to not just have like a little nibble I want everybody here to I want them to have a meal I want them to leave here later saying do you know what I feel stuffed coming out of church I I feel so full they're gonna I want them to stagger out of here I don't want them just to get up I want them to get up and think oh dear me I had far too much bread and fish okay so I want you to start with these two young ladies over here you notice I said young lady nester there you like that okay these two young ladies and I want them to have at least one roll each and a bit of fish and then I want you to do everybody else, starting on this side. Okay, but quickly, because we haven't got all today. Okay, right. You can eat the rolls because they, I washed my hands when I prepared them, and they were, they were put in the oven. They're all very, very clean, and they've been in foil. Okay? I'm sure the disciples were a bit quicker than this, Lizzie. Yeah, they, 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 were, they would have been quick quicker. Okay? Okay. Okay. So, yeah, give the vicar a fish. That's important. Okay, right. Now, Lizzie, what, what, <laughs> now, see, I, I think I know what, I think, come, come, come here, Lizzie, I think I know what you did wrong. Jesus gave thanks for it. Oh, of course. And we, we didn't give thanks. No. Do you think if we were to give thanks for it, we could have fed everybody here? Um, no. no. When Jesus gave thanks, what? Because Jesus. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Now, before you take over the rest of the sermon, can you, you can go sit, sit back down again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lizzie, for, for, for joining in. If, if you want to eat the bread, just carry on. It, it, is, it was fresh this morning, so please do feel free to, to eat it. The food was given out, and they all had a meal. They didn't have a, a little snack. They all had a meal. Now, I don't know about you, but that's kind of really impressive, you know, if I, if I was that little boy and I'd gone out with my meager little lunch, okay, and I'd given it to Jesus and realized that, can you imagine going home and telling mum and dad what happened? Mum, I don't know what you put in that fish, but it fed so many people. Jesus did the mir- a miracle with it. And there was plenty left over and there was plenty to eat. Now, it does say very clearly that there were 5,000 men. But do you know what? On top of that were the women and the children. And scholars actually estimate, and it is an estimate, that the total numbers would have been between 10 and 15,000. Now I've got an interesting little figure here which will particularly interest um, Steve and, and Bob. Did you know that, has any of you, any of you ever been to Kenilworth Road Football Club? Anyone been to the football ground? Okay. It holds 10,356 people. Now, if you think at the very minimum of what the scholars are estimating, that five loaves and two fish was enough to feed everybody in Luton Town Football Stadium, plus several bits left over. That's an awful lot of people. Now, as with a lot of scripture, whenever we read it, it's really important that we ask the Lord, what are you saying to us through this? What, Lord, are you saying to us as we read this passage? Now, what I'm going to say next is going to be quite hard for some people to hear, and I make no apology for that. In fact, no, I'm not. I'm not going to apologize because I prayed through this passage, and this Sunday there wasn't a set passage to read, and so I prayed over what passage to use, and I really, really felt, I don't know why I felt it, that it was the feeding of the 5,000 that I needed to preach on. And at the time, I didn't know why the feeding of the 5,000. I didn't realize why until I actually sat down and started to prepare it. So for what it's worth, here are my thoughts. That little boy had five loaves and two fish. That's all he had. 
he could have kept it, actually. And if he had kept it, I wouldn't be preaching on it this morning because it wouldn't have been in the, in the passage or it might have been another person whose lunch it was. But he had those five loaves and two fish. Now, when the disciple came up to him and said, you know what, I could really do with your lunch, he could have turned around and said, dream on. That's my food. I can't help it if they all didn't bother to bring their dinner with them. I did, and I'm not going to be hungry. He gave all of it to Jesus. Now, this church, whether you realize this or not, is struggling financially. Okay? We actually don't have enough money to be functioning correctly uh, in the things we could be doing as a church. And a lot of you give and give sacrificially. Okay? And nobody knows who gives what in this church. It's one of the great things in this church is the giving's only kind of one person ever knows what people give. And it's very easy, isn't it, when it comes to our giving to kind of to think, oh yeah, but see that Charles, he, he earns a lot of money. I, I know you don't, Charles, so don't, I'm not picking on you, okay? That, that Charles, have you seen the way he dresses? I mean, he's dressing down today, but you know, he's always got the swanky suits on and his, his, his son always wears the trendy stuff. Happy birthday, by the way, Jordan. Jordan was 16 this week, so uh, I did think about singing happy birthday, but I thought you and I, we might fall out if we did that, might we? Okay, but you might think, you think, oh yeah, and he, he, drives, he drives a Mercedes, okay? Albeit an old Mercedes, isn't it? Because it's a classic, a classic, okay? But we can have that mentality, can't we, where we look at other people and think, oh, it's okay for them, you know, they earn X so much, so they can give, it's easy for them. But if that little boy had taken that attitude... Those 5,000 people, possibly 10 or 15, would never have been fed. It's not about how much we give, it's about how we give it. Now, if we give willingly, sacrificially, asking God, God, I earn X amount. If I tithe, it would be X amount. But I can't afford to do that because then I won't be able to buy this and have that and feed the kids and, and, and keep the car running and everything else. Sometimes we've got to go to God and say, God, I know what the Bible says. I know what the, the church teaches on it. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to give? And I can tell you now from personal experience, you will never outgive God. Never outgive God. And I'm going to share a personal testimony, something quite recently our, our income has, has changed um, because for, for various reasons, and we are just literally on my salary at the moment. And I said to, to my wife, I said, well, if we're not earning the extra money, then are we, are we adjusting our, our giving? Just in a conversation. And she said, no. I said, well, how are we making ends meet at the moment then? She says, I'm praying about it. And I tell you what, it humbled me. It really, really humbled me. And do you know what? She probably answers, and it almost makes me want to cry because it really did humble me. Since she's been praying, every week, Sainsbury's keeps sending us big vouchers off our shopping. Now, the stupid thing is, we've only just gone over to Sainsbury's because our son has just taken a job there, so we now get 10% off. Trisha's been sent, and I'm not talking like 50p off or, you know, a couple hundred ne extra nectar points. I'm talking £9 vouchers off a £50 shop. So we've been breaking our shopping down and keep using these £9 vouchers. We've got 10% off because our son has got a job there now and he, he gets a thing off. We've found that we've constantly had enough when it's got to the end of the month. But that's because my wife had the faith to say, God, what do you want us to keep giving? And she kept giving. Now, it's very easy, isn't it, to think, well, it's easier for other people to do that. But actually, it's for each and every one of us to not kind of think, well, you know what, there's a bit, oh, I, I need that for that and that for that. Yeah, God, you, you can have that, okay? We need to go to God and say, what do you want me to give? And for some of you, it might be really good news. God might say, do you know what, actually, your giving's pretty cool at the moment. I'm, I'm happy with that. For some of you, my God was saying, I'm sorry, I didn't even notice you gave. Where, 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 where's your giving? Okay? And we can laugh. And it is funny to a degree, but God doesn't want us to do it grudgingly. 
You know, if you go to God and say, well, I've heard that blooming bald bloke speaking in church, and yeah, I feel kind of convicted, and I need to give a bit, so oh, there you go, God, take that. Okay? God doesn't want us to give like that. He wants us to give cheerfully. He wants us to give so our left hand doesn't know what our right hand is doing. He wants us to give so that other people in the church don't necessarily know what we give. So my challenge to you this morning is Jesus did the miraculous with five loaves and a little bit of fish. And you might think that the, the, the little bit of money you give to the church or the little bit of money you might give to the church won't do much. But in the hands of God, it can do a lot. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that you are a God who gave everything to us. You are a God who held nothing back, not even your only son. And I want to thank you, Lord, that as we've looked at, at that story this morning, Lord, where you fed all those people with that meager offering. Father, I pray that for each and every one of us, this won't just be uh, something taught from the Bible. This won't just be a sermon. This won't be some, a sermon we go away and remember the, the loaves and the, and the couple of fish being handed out by Lizzie and it being a bit funny. But that, Lord, you would really speak to us individually and collectively on how you want us to give as a church, how you want us to give as individuals. And, Lord, I pray and thank you in advance for the blessings that come when we're faithful in that. And how we will see, Lord, your faithfulness. And how, Lord, your provision can never, ever. You could, Lord, we just can't outgive you. And, Lord, we know that we would never, ever be without when we prioritize you. Father, we just thank you. And we ask you, Lord, to speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen.